Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 431st episode, we have a bunch of news, including a controversial paper on how smart T-Rex was. Oh, yes. That made the rounds on the internet. It did. I mean, it was sort of about theropods, but I think they might have even put Tyrannosaurus in the title. It seemed like they were really going for oh, a lot of attention. I thought it was theropods in general. Yeah. I mean, it kind of was, but we'll get into that more later. We've also got some items about pathologies. Nice. I mean, not nice for the dinosaurs that had injuries. No. But, <laughs> but interesting. interesting for us. Yeah. <laughs> Tells us about their lives. And we have an interview with Julius Chitney and Evan Johnson Ransom about their new, very comprehensive book, sort of a compendium of all sorts of new dinosaurs. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Lurdusaurus. But before we get into all of that, Real quick, we want to thank some of our patrons, and we have one new patron to thank this week, and that is Penguin Yelts. Thank you very much for yeah, joining. Thank you. You've already been pretty active in the Discord, and I have had fun talking to you, so I appreciate that. And then Rhonda got our shoutouts. We've got TRX Dinosaurs, The Howard Family, Kalosaurus Rex, James Pasco, George, Sauropod Susan, Dino Mo, Anna Rose and Quadrosaurus. Excellent. Thank you so much for being a dino at all with us. And at this point, the patches to our Triceratops Enough patrons should be mailed. <laughs> We've got them all sitting on our desk and the nice extra bonus piece of paper with the surprise on it, <laughs> ready to get packed up and shipped. That was vague. Yeah. And since we're recording this early, you may already have the patch. Oh, good point. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping into the news, we're going to kick it off with the controversial paper about dinosaur intelligence. All right. I know with this one, there was a lot to uh, read and digest. There was. The paper itself isn't that long, but since I don't know much at all about brain anatomy, I had to do a lot of background research <laughs> mm -hmm. so that it didn't just totally go over my head. So this paper was published by Susanna Herculana Hosel. There are no co-authors out on a limb solo on this paper. Mm. And that happens a lot. But are you mentioning that because this got so much attention? Yes. Yeah. And sometimes if there's a bunch of co-authors and say she had a bunch of co-authors that were T-Rex experts mm -hmm. or other dinosaur experts, you'd have some more confidence Possibly in mm. the, the dinosaur claims. But her background is neuroscience. Yes, exactly. And it was published in the Journal of Comparative Neurology. Not surprising because it's about brains. Mm -hmm. And the paper starts out by talking about the encephalization quotient, which we talked about years ago at this point, back before we knew that it was sort of a fraught <laughs> way of looking at intelligence of animals. But basically, it's a very rough way of estimating an expected brain size for body mass. So if you take, say, every mammal there is, and you plot the weight of the animal versus the brain mass of the animal, so the mass of the body versus the mass of the brain, and then you draw a line through the middle of it, you get the expected value. And then things that are above that line have more brain than you'd expect, and things that are below it have less brain than you'd expect, mm -hmm. and you can just come up with a number for how far they are from that line and therefore how much bigger their brain is and therefore maybe how much more they intelligent they are. You can kind of see this, well, I'm trying to remember what we said in the past about this, but like raptors. Raptors tend to have larger brain sizes compared to their bodies, right? Compared yeah. to other dinosaurs like a stegosaurus. Yeah, proportionally larger. And it's better than, the encephalization quotient is an improvement on just dividing the brain mass by the body size because it's not a simple straight line. It's not quite linear. You have to have a little bit of logarithmic growth to it because something that weighs 10,000 pounds doesn't have 10,000 times the size of a brain as something that weighs one pound. Mm -hmm. It tends to scale in different ways depending on the different animal groups. For example, sauropods have brains which are about the same size as a lion brain. But since sauropods are much bigger, we would expect sauropods to have much bigger brains, and therefore we might consider lions to be smarter if mm. we're looking at an encephalization quotient sort of thing. In the 1970s, people noticed that troodontids had the largest brains compared to their body size, so presumably they were the smartest. Mm -hmm. That's 
kind of the origin of that whole thing. <laughs> right. Everybody still sort of quotes to this day, including us from time to time, because we haven't come up with much better since then, even though we know it's not the best way to tell intelligence. There aren't a lot of options when you're looking at extinct animals with just empty skulls. Mm -hmm. Of course, comparing a mammal to a reptile is really hard to do since our brains are really quite different and they scale differently. And then it's hard to do dinosaurs because the largest birds we have aren't that big. We have some really big mammals, mm -hmm. but we don't have any really big birds, like on the size <laughs> scale of sauropods. Yeah. You know, the biggest bird we have is an ostrich. And what are they, like four or 500 pounds? We want something that's tens of thousands of pounds mm -hmm. <laughs> to compare to. So often people will just sort of try to extrapolate whatever they can. Sometimes they'll pick large mammals. Sometimes they'll try to scale up birds. Either way, though, it's pretty difficult when you're looking at something like a sauropod or a T-Rex. The biggest problem with encephalization quotients is that they're a little too simple because they only look at the overall brain size and not the regions of the brain. Hmm. We've talked about this a little bit in the past, but an animal with big, powerful eyes might have an enlarged brain to process sight, especially the regions that are intended for processing sight. But they likely weren't any better at problem solving if the other areas of the brain are the same. Mm -hmm. So you could have a brain that's five times as big, but if four times amount, <laughs> all that increased size is just dedicated to smelling or seeing, it might not actually mean they could problem solve or do anything else better. So these researchers propose that a more accurate measurement is the raw number of neurons in the telencephalon. This is the current paper? Yes. The telencephalon is a really big part of the brain. It's mostly used when talking about embryos, but it can be used to describe what that area of embryos turns into. And I think the reason they picked it is because there are different names for parts of the brain if you're talking about a human and a primate versus if you're talking about a bird. Mm -hmm. So if you use the telencephalon, we were the same when we were embryos. Mm. <laughs> or at least our braids look similar enough that it still has that same region. And so you can do a one-to-one -one comparison easier that way. In our brains, the telencephalon turns into the cerebral cortex and cerebral nuclei. The cerebral nuclei is a much smaller part, but it includes the basal ganglia, the amygdala, and the basal forebrain. But mostly, the important part of that is the cerebral cortex, which is the entire wrinkly surface of the brain, excluding a few small parts like the cerebellum at the bottom back of the brain. Mm. And about 80 to 90 percent of the surface of the human brain is cerebral cortex. We got wrinkly brains. We do. And that wrinkliness increases the surface area and the contact points between different neurons. It's really important. And it's considered one of the most important parts of the brain for higher order thinking. It includes about 16 billion neurons in humans. I think there's 80 to 90 billion in the whole brain. So hmm. by neuron count, it's not necessarily the biggest part, but it is maybe the most important part when it comes to thinking about stuff like problem solving. Hmm. However, of course, with dinosaurs, we can't measure the number of neurons in the telencephalon or any other part of the brain for that matter. Right. So we have to estimate the number of neurons based on the brain size, which in turn is inferred from how big the hollow space in the skull is. Mm -hmm. So you look at a skull, you see that little spot where the brain would have gone, you estimate how much of that space the brain would have filled up, and then you can estimate the size of the brain, and then you can estimate the number of neurons in that region. That's a lot of steps. It is, and obviously each one introduces some error. In order to try to get an accurate estimation, they split dinosaurs into the three main groups, them being sauropods, theropods, and ornithischians. And then they used metabolic rates of different archosaurs to try to scale the expected number of neurons in the telencephalon. This is maybe the first place where there's a potential for going wrong. Mm. They decided that most theropods, iguanodon, protoceratops, and archaeopteryx were endothermic, and they used a bird scaling and ended up with more neurons in their brains. Mm -hmm. And they decided that sauropods, triceratops, stegosaurus, and shavuya, which is an alvarosaurid and therefore a theropod, were ectothermic. Interesting. Which is a very strange choice, something I've never seen before. And they gave reptile scaling and therefore far fewer neurons to those brains. Huh. There's already such a debate over dinosaurs being endothermic and ectothermic and what range and all that. Yeah, I'm not even really sure why they decided to put a nickel down which ones were endothermic versus ectothermic because they did the calculation for all of them with endothermic and ectothermic oh, and okay. they could have just given the range 
and said, so for example, with Diplodocus, if it's a ectotherm, they estimated it had 150 million neurons. And then if it's an endotherm, they said 850. So they could have just put both and mm. said, we don't know, because if you're studying the brain, why would you get into that? Maybe it was to spark discussion and further research. Yeah, I think they just wanted to have an exact number. And mm -hmm. that way they could do a comparison to another animal that had a number of neurons. But those choices that they made were largely based on the sizes of the brains with the justification that larger brains are endothermic. So the logic is a little bit circular and sort of compounding in that the larger brains mean that they were endothermic, which means that they had more neurons. So you end up with larger brains with more neurons and smaller brains with fewer neurons. Mm. So the dinosaurs with the larger brains are modeled as much higher neurons overall. Mm. So for the results, because I think the results are interesting, and as a quick reminder for sort of level setting, humans have about 16 billion neurons in our telencephalon, and I'm going to do these all millions, so that's 16,000 million neurons. Okay, because the dinosaurs are measured in millions, so it's easier to compare? Yes. The cute little chest clawed Shavuya has 11 million neurons, which is less than one one thousandth the number in humans. Of course, that's looking at it being ectothermic or in common parlance, cold-blooded. If it was endothermic, aka warm-blooded, it would have had 35 million neurons. So still not very many, yeah. depending on either way you look at it. Compared to a human. Yeah. Even compared to the other dinosaurs. Mm. It had a very small brain, apparently. Archaeopteryx had about 50 million. Stegosaurus had about 80 million. Diplodocus and Triceratops were very close, right around 150 million. Brachiosaurus was about 300 million. Protoceratops was about 500 million. And that's largely because they put it in the endothermic category, whereas Triceratops was ectothermic. Interesting. They basically said on their plots of body size versus brain size, Protoceratops looks like it was closer to some endothermic stuff. So they decided it was endothermic, hmm. which seems crazy to me that you would put Triceratops and <laughs> Protoceratops in different groups. But that's what they did. Troodon, they said about 700 million, which is roughly around a crow. So that's sort of interesting, mm -hmm. given what we always talk about with Troodon. And crows. Yeah. Allioramus, the Tyrannosaurid, had about 1,000 million. Iguanodon had about 1,500 million. Really weird that that's twice Troodon. I was not expecting that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Allosaurus was about 1,900 million. And Tyrannosaurus, depending on the specimen, was between 2,200 and 3,300 million. And that number is similar to a baboon. And that's all the headlines. Exactly. Everybody said T-Rex was as smart as a baboon. That was the takeaway from this. And they weren't really reaching, all those headlines weren't really reaching from the actual claims of the paper. That's basically what the paper said was, we think T-Rex was as smart as a baboon mm. based on this. Because... They were actually arguing that the raw number of neurons in the telencephalon doesn't scale with body mass. The only thing that matters is the number of neurons, and that'll tell you how much thinking power the animal had. Interesting. It is very interesting. That claim alone is not without controversy. Sure, although we don't know too much about neuroscience ourselves. I know more now. Yeah. <laughs> I found a few experts on neuroscience who were saying that is not a widely accepted belief that mm. an animal that's 100 times the size with more neurons in the telencephalon would be 100 times smarter than something that's proportionally smaller and proportionally smaller brain. It's far, far from settled. On Twitter, the author mentioned they had a paper years ago that more neurons in the cerebral cortex correlates to longer life for warm-blooded animals, and then took the conclusion that Tyrannosaurus had a similar number of neurons to a baboon, and then came to the conclusion that they would have, quote, had a similar life history as a baboon, end quote. Hmm. And that means that they would have reached sexual maturity at about four to five years and lived between 42 to 49 years. Well, I do remember seeing some Tyrannosaur experts not agreeing with this. Yeah, that's almost certainly wrong. So Tyrannosaurus was still very small at four years old. Mm -hmm. Physiological data that we have puts the estimate at three times that age at the youngest, 12 years old. I think Thomas Carr's most recent paper was more like 16 years old. When they're sexually mature. Exactly. The oldest T-Rex that we have too is about 30. It's not even close to 42. Yeah, but that's one of those like 
what don't we know? But we have like a hundred T. Rex specimens. Yeah, and like we were talking about in a, a long time ago, some of them were senescent. They seem to be completely stopped growing and yeah. you know well on in years. We do have some Carcharodontosaurids that lived around that long, but not T. Rex. But given the variability in the animal kingdom, guessing maturity rates and maximum age based on the brain neurons seems like a really weird reach. So I'm not sure why they did that. Hmm. They also extrapolate some behaviors to modern birds with that number of neurons. They said that birds like parrots and crows can, quote, solve problems and create their own tools and build their own culture, end quote. Yeah, we've seen that. And they said that T-Rex, quote, already had what it takes to do all that, end quote. Ooh, that would be really interesting <laughs> if, I mean, I have no idea how we could know this for sure, but the idea of T-Rex creating tools and building a culture, pretty interesting. Yes. I mean, we know they didn't do metal work or anything because well. none of that's in the fossil record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't think parrots and crows do metal work either. <laughs> but weirdly... So I said how Troodon had about 700 million neurons and was roughly about a crow. Tyrannosaurus being more like a baboon. I guess baboons don't do metal work either. Mm -hmm. But that would make them much smarter than crows, which is quite the claim because I've never heard a dinosaur scientist claim that T-Rex was as smart as a crow. In fact, I've seen quite a few papers looking at the regions of the brain mm -hmm. pointing out that T-Rex was much less intelligent than a crow. So it's weird that it's got five times the neurons. They're saying all that matters is the number of neurons. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't line up with previous papers. It really doesn't. I do really like the idea of trying to estimate the number of neurons in the cognitive part of the dinosaur brain, though. I think it's a really good idea, mm -hmm. and I think it's worth pursuing. But unfortunately, I think they skipped a couple of key steps. So they just took a correlation of number of telencephalon neurons and applied it to brain mass. So they'd basically have, you know, you've got all these birds and you see how many neurons they have in their telencephalon compared to their brain mass. And then you plot the line and then you say, okay, T-Rex was this big. Its brain was this big. How many neurons did it have? Mm -hmm. But they didn't actually look at what we think the dinosaur brain anatomy looked like in order to draw their conclusions. In other words, they didn't look at how big the telencephalon was in a T-Rex. Mm. And we kind of know that because from the shape of the brain case, we can estimate different regions of the brain and we can figure out which parts of the brain would have been useful for things like sight and smell versus things that might have been used for thinking about problem solving. Mm. And they didn't include any of that brain anatomy in their analysis at all. So it's basically the same problem as the encephalization quotient all over again. We're looking at brain sizes and estimating number of neurons from the brain sizes. But at the end of the day, it's still basically just a brain size comparison. Kai Casper on Twitter pointed out that in general, amniotes have less neuronal density as their brains get bigger. So scaling up a bird brain a thousand times the size to a T-Rex could be vastly overestimating the number of neurons in the brain. Mm. And I think Kai is also a neuroscientist. Kai is a PhD in zoology. Oh, okay. But pretty familiar with brains because they were already familiar with the other research done in this field. Kai also cited the paper that I was trying to find. It was published in Science in 2021 by Christopher Torres et al. And it was a paper that showed that after non-avian dinosaurs went extinct, the bird brains rapidly changed shape to increase the size of the cerebrum where complex problem solving happens. So that one was looking at the anatomy and how the anatomy changed and may have made birds smarter after the KPG boundary. But that paper was notably not cited by this newer paper because, mm -hmm. again, they weren't looking at the anatomy. My favorite thing was Kai's tweet where he said, quote, what I fear is that neuron number could become the new EQ, meaning encephalization quotient, or relative divided by absolute brain size of cognition research, flawed proxies of intelligence that do little in helping us understand the evolution of animal minds and that ignore the complexity of living neural tissue, end quote. Mm. What it seemed to me was because this author, when the paper came out, tweeted welcoming discussion and feedback from paleontologists specifically. So it seems like this was a paper that was meant to spark discussion and maybe future research. Yeah. And that is a good thing to do. But I would say 
they should have been a co-author on the paper mm. or during the peer review process, the paleontologist should have peer reviewed it rather than it getting fully published as a, we think this is valid and including things like they were as smart as baboons. Mm. <laughs> I do wonder though, if now there's people currently doing research on this or, you know, dinosaur brains in general to add to this discussion. Yeah, there'll probably be a response. What I'm hoping, I think you're right. I think it can't hurt to have more discussion about stuff like this. And what I'd like to see is a better understanding of which regions of the brain really impact the intelligence of an animal. Mm -hmm. Because now we've got a pretty good understanding of some of the regions in these dinosaurs' brains when we have good endocasts. And if we can better understand how those brains scale at different sizes and what the neuron counts are at these different sizes and what that means for their intelligence, we might be able to get a better understanding of how smart these different dinosaurs were. Yeah. It definitely has a lot more potential to teach us about the intelligence of the animals than just doing the encephalization quotient, which doesn't include anatomy at all. This at least is going in the right direction because they're trying to sort of infer the size of the telencephalon, which is a part of the brain by looking at similar animals. But we don't need to do that. We could actually look at the anatomy of it. The telencephalon is also a really large part, which includes stuff like where you see and smell. Mm. So it might be good to exclude that piece. And anyway, I think it's a step in the right direction, but it's a small step. It's not a we know how smart T Rex is step. Sure. But it definitely got a lot of people interested. It did. Yeah. It riled a lot of people up. <laughs> <laughs> As promised, we've got a couple of pathology papers. Starting with one poor Allosaurus had 10 pathologies. Oh, man, that is a lot. Yeah, I know. This was published in Historical Biology by Lita Shing and others. It was a sub-adult theropod, so not even a fully adult Allosaurus and already had 10 pathologies. Hmm. This is from the Morrison Formation in Wyoming in the U.S., so this is around the late Jurassic. There's multiple pathologies found in the vertebrae and parts of the shoulder and irregular growths on the vertebrae and other vertebrae that was fused where it shouldn't have been, like two vertebrae fused together. Also, parts of the shoulder were fused together and parts were swollen. That is a lot. Yeah, so the 10 pathologies, they include that they're from trauma, possible infection, tumor-related, and arthritis. It's a lot of things. <laughs> that is. Yeah, I assume the ones like things breaking and then healing fused is probably trauma but you can like fused vertebrae in a human back can happen from all sorts of different causes mm -hmm. so yeah it can be a little bit hard to nail down what exactly caused the different injuries the authors also said that none of these pathologies quote would have been directly fatal <laughs> keyword directly <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> if you're not able to move your arm particularly well and other animals notice that it's not necessarily a good thing for you. Yeah. They mentioned that this Allosaurus may have died, quote, due to changes in predation patterns that could have resulted in food shortages, end quote. Oh, interesting. So predation patterns that could have resulted in food shortages. So basically saying if there was less food available, this specific theropod might not have been as good at catching it. And if there's a shortage, it's the one that's going to miss out. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. The idea is that it might, these pathologies may not have affected its ability to move, but it definitely would have made it harder to hunt, mm -hmm. especially the shoulder pathology. Yeah, and it's sort of like that you don't have to outrun everybody you're running with. You mm -hmm. just have to outrun the slowest person. I guess the same thing applies if you're a predator. <laughs> <laughs> if all the other predators are outrunning you and out hunting you, mm -hmm. then you're not going to be able to eat. Yeah, especially if they don't share. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this specimen, the subadult Allosaurus, is at the Grandview Museum of Nature Science in Guangzhou, China. Just FYI. Poor Allosaurus. Yeah, that's a bummer. Although very interesting. Yeah. And the next pathology is about an ornithomimosaur that was injured via blunt force trauma to its foot. Ouch. Uh, thank you to one of our listeners who mentioned this one to us. That almost sounds like a police report, injured by blunt force trauma. Ah, um, because <laughs> the blunt force part. Yeah. Yeah. This was published in the anatomical record by Chinzorig and others, and it's open access. If anyone else wants to read all the 
gory details. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a newly described but not yet named ornithomimosaur from the Utah Formation in Mississippi. This is from the late Cretaceous. Oh, we've had a few from down there. That's mm -hmm. like in the neck of the woods is Arkansas and some of that stuff. Yeah. And this ornithomimosaur had abnormal bone growth in one of the long bones of the metatarsal in the right foot. So there's a nearly complete isolated metatarsal of this theropod, ornithomimosaur. <laughs> I hope there's more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just focused on the pathology here. It's estimated to be similar in size to Arkansas's Friday eye around 837 pounds or 380 kilograms, and also similar in size to Beishan Long, which is about 826 pounds or 375 kilograms, and Gallimimus, which is about 880 pounds or 400 kilograms. Yeah, we're finding a fair number of those Gallimimus-sized ornithomimosaurs mm -hmm. down in the southern U.S., and a lot of them, unfortunately, are pretty fragmentary and just basically foot bones. <laughs> yeah, for now. Who knows what could happen in the future? True. Now, the authors did x-rays and histology on this foot, and they found a butterfly fragment fracture pattern, which is, according to the paper, a, quote, classic pattern of bending bone failure that results from three-point bending, end quote. It's commonly associated with blunt force trauma to a long bone. They also found secondary osteomyelitis, which is inflammation of the bone. Interesting. Sounds painful. Yeah. I can't even imagine the butterfly, those sorts of reactions and like material science things for how things bend when mm -hmm. they're hit. And looking at the pictures, I can't really tell where the butterfly is. It almost looks more like a zigzag to me. Mm -hmm. Like it gets hit on one side and that causes a break. And then there's like a sort of a rebounding break and another break. So there's like broken in multiple directions. Maybe the zigzag is the butterfly. It must be, yeah. So the interpretation is that there was blunt force trauma to the foot, possibly from battling another ornithomimid or from defending against a predator. And then that blunt force trauma to the foot resulted in a fracture and some soft tissue injury. And then that developed into a bacterial infection that ended up destroying the bone. So this ornithomimosaur probably had trouble putting weight on that foot until it died. Yeah, I can imagine that. It's broken in three different directions. That's mm -hmm. not something you can walk on for sure. They didn't have splints or casts or anything. Or the ability to rest for long periods of time. Yeah. It's especially bad if you're bipedal, I feel like. If you're quadrupedal, maybe you could use the other three legs a little bit. Maybe. Although that's probably still trouble. Yeah. And bipedal, you could technically hop. <laughs> I'm one leg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. It's tough. <laughs> Or dinosaur. Mm hmm Dinosaur pathologies are always rough. On a lighter note, in just a moment, we'll get on to our interview with Evan and Julius. But first, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. And now on to our interview with Evan and Julius about their brand new book. But a quick note, or two quick notes, we have an extended version of this interview for our patrons. So if you're a patron, you might want to check that out in your premium content feed. But also, we recorded this interview at SVP, so there's a little bit more background noise. We're just releasing it a little bit later because we wanted to be closer to the book launch. We are joined today by Julius Chitney and Evan Johnson Ransom who are both the illustrator and the author of a new book, respectively, called Dinosaur World. And we wanted to talk to them because it looks like a really cool book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So 1,200. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that is a massive amount to cover. <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. Because when I was first approached by it, I thought it was going to be more like a children's book. Mm -hmm. But after reading more context into it, I'm like, oh, it's going to be a book about every dinosaur that was discovered up until like 2022. Wow. In fact, it kind of serves like the, uh, remind me of like one of the older books I used to have as a kid. Like there was the uh, Complete Dinosaur Encyclopedia by Dougal Dixon, which always served as like the main source, of like my inspiration to being a paleontologist and also... When I was a child, I always wanted to write a dinosaur book that included every dinosaur that was discovered. So, Well done. I finally got my wish. 14-year-old <laughs> Evan would be proud. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, 
it was a, a, a massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still recovering from it a few <laughs> months later, but <laughs> illustrating, I think, about 1,243 in total, and about 855 or so of them were like really highly detailed because we had a bunch of nomen dubium um, yeah. tax mm -hmm. as well, but the 850 some were like you know well enough preserved so that we could you know have a pretty nice entry for each one and and of course about a hundred of those also have a double page illustration spread so there was a lot of illustrating wow but um it was fun because it's like with evan was saying about having a dream of writing about all the dinosaurs i also kind of i remember in one interview a few years back i one of my dreams that i'd mentioned was to illustrate every dinosaur known. And yeah, I kind of got my wish as well. <laughs> and a little bit more, even more so, because now, of course, so many more have been described in the last few years. It's incredible. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's really like an exponential rate of dinosaur discovery. Is there a illustration for each of these dinosaurs or each of the non-nomum yeah. dubium? How did you break that down? So what we did was that there's an illustration for the 800 dinosaur taxa, but for the nomen dubium ones, I think what we did was, was that we had like a placeholder image. So any of the dinosaurs that was featured in the 800, we used those as like a placeholder, but kind of like give them like little different color codings, however. So like red for the carnivorous theropods, green was going to be for like the herbivorous dinosaurs. Hmm. Uh, but we also specified like which group they specifically belong to, like say tyrannosauroid, diplodosoid, uh, ceratops and stuff like that. Cool. And the the colors, I'm not sure if we ended up sticking with that particular code and so on. But the other thing is that for some of the nomen dubium, there were a few that were well enough preserved to provide a bit more of a detailed illustration. So even those ones are, in the end, they turned out to be more than placeholders as well. So they're all kind of a little bit different. And in many cases, of course, the the common aspects of them, we managed to share some of the same um, sort of visual reconstruction bits. But if there's like, you know, specially unique types of aspects of them, for example, those are usually highlighted as well. And in some cases, like monoclonias, for example, there was a, you know, a more detailed reconstruction of those ones. So you'll find a few of those ones scattered among the nomen dubium as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because some of the nomen dubium are like, someone named it and then it was never really referenced ever again and other ones are became a big part of people's knowledge and then yeah so what did you guys do for stuff like brontosaurus so brontosaurus it's now a valid taxon mm -hmm. and the thing is is that we gave a more detailed description for apatosaurus but for some of the dinosaurs like brontosaurus we gave it like an essential facts however like originally Brontosaurus was thought to be its own genus, but then it turns out like it was lumped within Apatosaurus. But later studies now show that Brontosaurus is now its own separate genus, however. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So then Apatosaurus got the full double page spread. One of them makes sense to be one of the sort of more well-known dinosaurs. And so each of those ones has its own encyclopedic entry and also a double page spread in, in the case of about 100 of them. And yes, Apatosaurus is one of those. But yeah, Brontosaurus has its own illustration as well. So we have covered both of those. It's kind of nice to see as much sort of up-to-date information on this. And it was nice to see all of the different aspects that you had highlighted in that, Evan. Thank you. Yeah. Did your work, I know you did, what was it called? It was like Sauropod <laughs> Summer and... You had the one with the tyrannosaurs. Yeah, so I did a couple of Twitter highlights. The first one that I did was 25 Days of Tyrannosaurs. So that was back in, it was December of 2019. So during the month of December, it was about different tyrannosauroids. The summer was Summer of Theropods. So I just highlighted every theropod that was discovered. That was probably my favorite one to do because it was just like, a, let me do something fun for the summer. And then for December, December 2020, that was Sauropodosember. That's and then what it was. for uh, <laughs> December of 2021, it, I kind of like highlight most of the theropods that I use for my thesis. Okay, that makes sense. But the, all of these, did they help inform this book? Oh, definitely. I think for most of like Sauropodosember and for Summer of Theropods, I used some of the information that I recycled from that to the dinosaur book, but I had to tweak some things, however. Sure. Nice. Yeah. That was actually something that really stood out as well. I think to the, the publishing team, uh, that's one of the things that your your posts about dinosaurs like that really are, are I think, one of the things that made you being a top selection for Aww. the book project. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, that kind of thing really stands out and gets noticed. And, and in many cases, or in some cases, at least ends up <laughs> producing yeah. a project like this, I guess. So that's really Aww. neat. Thank you.
So it almost sounds like you guys started from the art side and then added in the technical. Were you involved in the project earlier, Julius? Yeah, I was the um, founder of the uh, publisher head kind of throwing the idea at me that, hey, let's do a book on all dinosaurs. Because I've done a series of books with them illustrating everything from whales to sharks and uh, cats was the most recent one and, and reptiles in general. And then, and then they've come up with new ideas all the time. And he thought illustrating a book on all dinosaurs to launch a new series of books, kind of an encyclopedia series, because uh, this is normally sort of a, this series before this, the discovering series was mostly targeted at kids, but um, it seems like a lot of adults like it as well. I mean, mm -hmm. so they wanted to do something that was a little bit more meaty. Mm -hmm. And so this one is definitely uh, a lot more meaty with all the dinosaurs, basically. Uh, we might have missed a couple of them here or there, but vast majority of them. And so, yeah, so this was kind of like more targeted towards not just kids, but adults as well, the full range. And so that should be kind of a nice way to do it, I think. Yeah. We'll see if it works out well. I'm hoping that people get interested in it. Oh, definitely. Because I have, of course, spread some over to uh, some of the classes at University of Chicago. And I know a couple of professors were like, this is a very impressive book. In fact, one professor commented on like, um, this could definitely work for like a good trading card information too. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. I can imagine someone's going to like Xerox some of the copies of the pages and then just make like trading cards for them. I think that would be <laughs> really nice. That would be. <laughs> yeah. Imagine the poster that could be made out of like all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Julius, I, for our listeners, I, I'm sure they're familiar with your name because <laughs> you're an amazing paleo artist. Well, like we, I think we told you we we have at least one of your prints hanging up. It's one of the ones our baby likes to stare at. So oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Were you able to reuse any of your work for this or is it everything from scratch? Uh, most of it's from scratch. Uh, some of them I was able to reuse, but... In general, I wanted to produce newer stuff. So even the ones that were used, I've tended to either repose them or recolor them and, or a combination of them. And of course, it's a combination of painting and photographic compositing. So that's part of why I was able to even pull it off in the amount of time that was available. So you'll see I use sort of a, I generate my own textures for the skin and so on. And a lot of it is, I mean, it's almost all new stuff that's been built up. And so I, I like to construct dinosaurs, kind of building them up from, from the bits and and, 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 and highlighting. And you'll see some of the images there that you'll see some parts that, that look like they're sort of similar to other ones. So in many cases, the common aspects, the, the less well-known parts of them, there's less detail. But in those areas where we know there is some, you know, really well-preserved features, that's where a lot of the extra detail got put in. And so my hope is that we manage to do a good job of, of representing these dinosaurs as accurately as possible. And you'll see that there's a difference between like the integuments, for example, you have things, everything ranging from scaly skin to feathers. And I've tried to be as uh, accurate as possible in terms of those ones for which we do have direct evidence for the type of integument that mm -hmm. they had. And in some cases, of course, using phylogenetic bracketing in addition to fill in what would be the most plausible type of integument, but also there's a bit of a range so that there isn't full agreement between different workers in the field as to which dinosaurs would have had a particular kind of integument regardless of their genetic propensity to be able to express, for example, feathers and so mm -hmm. on. So we kind of a little bit kind of deliberately went and spread things out that way so that, you know, we can have a little bit of interesting sort of conversation between people that way. Mm -hmm. The color is just... It gave me a chance to really explore a whole lot of different possible avenues. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure. I love to look at how wildlife uses color, how they've evolved color to communicate with each other or to hide from each other. And this kind of gave me a way to try to balance off realistic, hopefully realistic, plausible color patterns with what would be very attractive artistically as well, but still fall within the constraints of what we might expect to find within animals. Nice. Yeah, I can imagine with paleo art, you have so much flexibility that if you're drawing a couple hundred sauropods, <laughs> you can do almost every possible permutation of the different aspects. Absolutely. And there's a lot of that I haven't actually done that I kind of would have wished I would have a chance to do it. But, Next you book. know, yeah. Well, that's the nice thing about this book is that 
as dinosaurs, you know, are being described at such a high rate, right? We could add new ones every few years and make a mm. new edition of the book. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely, <laughs> yeah. Because there actually was like one dinosaur that I kind of wish we did include, which was a uh, Maraxis, and there was mm -hmm. also that new Gondwanan Thyrophoran. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, bipedal armor cl armor club tailed one, I think. Oh wow, yeah, yeah. There's I think it's called a Stegoros. I think it was. Oh, we have yeah. Stegoros in it. That yeah, one it's in there. We do. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's so many I have a hard time remembering. <laughs> You'd remember that one because drawing that one is different with its crazy tail. It was, yeah, it's like a wild battle axe of mm -hmm. some sort. But yeah, that was. But there's so many that 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 you know we had to cut it off at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know our intention is to just you know our, our urge is to include all of them, but you have to stop at some point. Yeah, because um, <laughs> I think because there was actually one major update. There was like that new Mecha Raptor that was discovered mm -hmm. back in um, I think it was. April, I believe. And for that one, that actually showed that like, oh, Megaraptorans are now classified as Tyrannosauroids, even though it's kind of like, well, they're either basal Solarosaurus or Allosauroids, but it now shows like Megaraptorans are basal Tyrannosaurids. So we actually had to like uh, make sure that the Megaraptoran section was included within the Tyrannosauroid section. Mm -hmm. That's the hard thing about a book like this where you're going as up to date as possible is that it, things keep changing. Oh, yes, definitely. I think one of the tricky issues was, of course, the phylogenetics for stuff, where it's kind of like we have to make sure like everything was classified within the right order. But we know that like there's going to be like a new paper or study that comes out that will show like, oh, it's now part of this group and all. But at the same time, I think it just shows like we were still able to like keep everything as up to date as possible, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a never ending battle of new dinosaurs. Oh, to yes, be definitely. <laughs> as new studies are done on what maybe some of these are, are, are currently in the nomadubium section. Uh, maybe some of those will ultimately raise to a much more valid taxon status. In that case, they can we can easily just kind of update the illustrations to make them oh, a lot definitely. more, you mm -hmm. know, fitting within this sort of more specific type of uh, taxonomic uh, placement and so on. Definitely. Yeah, that's true. So you also mentioned the flyer for the book and you've got a mention of camouflage on the dinosaurs. How much of the camouflage is Julius having fun versus what we've actually found in the paleontological record? So that's a good question, actually. This was a fun time to experiment with um, uh, that balance. Mm -hmm. And so in the cases where there is information known about the color patterns, either the markings or, or to some extent even the hues of the dinosaurs um, uh, plumage or their skin based on either a combination of melanin directly preserved or melanophores or other or, or even a structural coloration like in microraptor for example I, I tried to be as true to form you know to, to include accurate information about those ones for which we do have information and in of course in those situations where we don't I did a combination of looking at modern animals and so to try to use similar types of strategies that they have uh, sort of uh, used, not to, you know, say teleological use of color, but really <laughs> what ev um, evolution has uh, generated in them um, that tends to work in certain environments. But also, you know, I always keep referring to the fact that this one fish I saw in one aquarium had, you know, blue lips with pink polka dots. <laughs> it's just some things you just really can't foresee. And to me, that's always gives me a little bit of a, uh, you know, sort of a fun type of uh, comfort of, of realizing that some kinds of, there's a lot of room for speculation and color patterns in, in prehistoric animals for which we don't have direct evidence. And so it's okay to be a little bit creative with that because you know, dinosaurs are birds, as you said, Evan, and, and we know birds are really good at uh, breeding plumage and mm -hmm. how that changes from season to season even. So who's to say how much color and how many intricate patterns there may have been in dinosaurs uh, in tegumens. And so I kind of, you know, experimented a little bit with things that I had a good chance to be able to show all sorts of possibilities. And in some cases, uh, you know, incorporated even certain kinds of fun things, you know, like if I know certain paleontologists who describe certain dinosaurs had particular, you know, interests and so on, I would maybe sometimes bring that into it. Or, you know, <laughs> they seen they had certain like pets colorations. In some cases, I was a little bit influenced by that even. But again, within the range of, you know, plausible constraints. And so, you know, you kind of have fun and also are able to kind of, um, you know, try to be accurate and so on. So yeah, it was definitely a combination of strategies.
Did you work in any blue lips and pink polka dots <laughs> into it? I don't think I went that far, actually. <laughs> I think I, I missed on that. But there were definitely some brightly colored ones. And so um, I one of the things I tried to do is more often than not, keep in mind the evolution of pigments and how certain pigments are more likely to be expected in certain taxa than others. So for example, carotenoids in modern birds, giving them their yellows and rich oranges and reds are usually derived from their food. And so we don't know really if dinosaurs, you know, Mesozoic dinosaurs did that or not. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful. But one of the things I try to avoid doing is putting too much yellows and reds, for example, into those dinosaurs, especially uh, carnivorous theropods that are less likely to have gotten these pigments from their food than mm -hmm. say ones that may have relied on, on frugivory or um, other types of herbivory where they might have encountered these pigments in the plants. And so bright yellow, you know, really heavily bright yellow animals are probably less common among these soaked dinosaurs, I would think. And so I try to avoid that in most situations. There are some exceptions. And so we have certain kinds of pigments today that in certain birds have evolved specially that give them certain greens and reds that are not based on carotenoids, for example. Uh, but And we also don't know if there were pigments that a dinosaur is in the Mesozoic had evolved specifically then that went extinct with them. So oh, entire true. evolutionary lineages may no longer be available to us uh, to, to observe and we may never have evidence of that. So there's certainly room for speculation, but also, you know, just trying to be as conservative as possible. So it's kind of a balance. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. To go along with that, Evan, how did you decide which facts? Because I, I assume when you're listing 1,200 dinosaurs in a book, <laughs> there's not a lot of space for each dinosaur. How did you decide? Is it like every dinosaur has a length, weight, estimate, and then like some other details? Or how yeah, did you so it's kind of so for the double page spreads, we had like detailed information, so we made sure like there was room for like uh, familiar ones like T. Rex, Spinosaurus, but. Also, some for like those were lesser known or recently discovered. So, like let's say Nasutoceratops, or even like with a, or even like with a Futalongosaurus, or even or even Patagotitan. Now, for those that just had like a single entry, they also have like the uh, body size, the length, and weight, and all. But we also had like essential facts for some. Like, what was their significance? Like, say for the new Megaraptoran, it was significant for 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 showing that megaraptorans are actually basal tyrannosauroids. There was even one for uh, Mapusaurus about like how we found like a on like a family pack of them. And then there was also just some on some on like let's say uh, Monoclonius too. Everything you'd need for a trading card. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, <it's> special abilities. <laughs> oh yes, definitely. <laughs> Is there anything else that we haven't asked you about the book that you think we should know about? I think you're definitely going to like the dinosaur biology section because there's not a lot of books really talk about dinosaur biology. And we try to include like as much up-to-date information as well to make it very unique. Nice. So is that stuff like their organs like uh, guessing at that kind of stuff no it's not no not necessarily like that it kind of deals more with like neural anatomy so we make endocasts there's feeding behavior there's also stuff on feeding mechanics hmm. ontogenetic niche partitioning then there's also some stuff that's on the uh, life history of dinosaurs too nice yeah, I could see. Yeah, you have to have the feeding mechanics because that's like, <laughs> that's <laughs> and your also, thing. <laughs> and, and also a section on dinosaur color too. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yes, definitely need that. When you have hundreds of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and there's a, there's kind of like a little uh, graphic that uh, we put together. Um, and then the uh, publishers also kind of sort of reinterpreted in a in a, a much nicer <laughs> way than I had uh, kind of played around with graphically to show the, the phylogenetic or the, I guess it's, well, in that sense, it's the taxonomic sort of a distribution of dinosaurs. And it's interesting because it's like a very, very nested set of, uh, it's a different way of, of showing it than a phylogenetic tree. And hmm. I think it works in this case because you can tell which group is a subset of whichever other group. And, and so there's many layers of nesting like that. And so it might help to sort of allow people to disentangle what exactly is a margin of cephalia and what does that include and how is that related to like heterodontosaurids and so on. And, 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 and so this kind of thing could be hopefully useful for people as well. So it's a very sort of succinct, succinct way of, of, of presenting that. And it has all of the groups that are uh, contained within the book so that when you see one group after another group, uh, it can sometimes be 
confusing to know which of those groups were part of which other one. So, so hopefully this graphic will help to clarify all of these relationships within uh, within the book. Nice. Yeah, yeah that is always a, a difficult thing because there are so many names for different dinosaur groups and a lot of them are very close, but like just one level up and it includes like two more dinosaurs. Yeah. You might not realize it's <laughs> yeah. basically the same name. <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. That was part of the tricky part, but I'm really glad that the publishers did include that. So yeah. I think that actually helps simplify things a lot too. Yeah, that, that does sound like a good addition. Cool. I'm excited to see how that's represented. I'm excited to see the whole thing. Yeah, all 704 <laughs> pages of it. This is definitely the biggest book that I've ever illustrated. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. That is big. I forgot to ask you how long that's it is. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. So what is that? I think about, about three per page. And then there's like uh, these double page spreads for some of them with full environment. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Now, mm-hmm. I yeah. guess you could say. Yeah, it sounds like it's really good for if you are just getting into dinosaurs and you get the the basic explanations, what is a dinosaur? And then you can see all these amazing illustrations. But then if you're, you maybe if you've been into dinosaurs for a long time too, and you just want a reference or even, you know, it's hard to keep up to date with everything that's come out until 2022. So <laughs> yeah, We're hoping it's going to be uh, more useful than a paperweight of the same mass. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the that's the minimum usefulness yes. it can be, at least. <laughs> cool. Yeah, and so this comes out in February 2023. Right. Great. And people can buy it wherever they buy books. Yes, but you can also pre-order it too. Cool. Yes. And of course, a lot of different major book uh, sellers are already running it. So you can, you know, this publishing company has had their books appear in all of the major bookstores for the ones that I've done before. And so they tend to have a really good, effective way of getting their material out there. So I really ha- doubt people will have too much trouble finding it once it goes fully online. I know some stores don't have pre-orders, but most of them that I found actually are available, as you said, Evan. So that's nice that people can already access it. Yeah, nice. that's great. And just once again, it's called Dinosaur World. Awesome. Well, thank you both for sitting down and talk to us about your new book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julius and Evan, for talking with us about your book, Dinosaur World. We are so excited for it, and I can't believe that there's over 1,200 dinosaurs in this one book. (laughs) That is a lot. Yeah, our record's 158 dinosaurs in one book. So a little bit over 10% of what they (laughs) pulled off. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Amazing. And if you want to purchase your own copy of Dinosaur World, then head over to our show notes at inodino.com. We'll have a link. And in just a moment, we'll get into our dinosaur of the day. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Lurdosaurus, which was a request from Paleo Mike 716 via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Lurdosaurus was an iguanodont that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Niger in the Elraz formation. It looked similar to iguanodon, but it was bigger. It was so massive, in fact, it was probably quadrupedal, had oh, to walk on four legs. We're getting into the Wuriguanodontians quadrupedal territory here. Yes. <laughs> At least some of them. It was estimated to be about 23 to 30 feet or 7 to 9 meters long and about six and a half feet or two meters tall when it was walking on all fours, but its stomach would only have been a little over two feet or 70 centimeters Uh above the ground, and that's based on the length of the ribs. Lurdosaurus also weighed about five and a half tons. Ooh, that's pretty heavy. Yeah, although in 2016, Gregory Paul suggested Lurdosaurus was about 23 feet or seven meters long and weighed two and a half tons. Still pretty large. Went on a diet, (laughs) lost half its weight. (laughs) (laughs) In 2005, Yo Hailu and others said that Lurdosaurus was classified in a group, quote, distinguished by their massively constructed body forms, end quote. <laughs> That's an interesting way to phrase it as it stood out because it was really big. Yes. Well, <laughs> average adult hadrosaurids are about 7 to 12 meters long and 3,000 kilograms. Oh, so that, if you go by the Gregory Paul estimate, that's pretty much normal maybe even on the smaller side yeah but if you go by the other estimate it's much larger yeah well maybe not much larger but larger Tekka and russell who officially named lurdosaurus described lurdosaurus as ponderous or very heavy they said that in a squat posture lurdosaurus quote must have somewhat resembled ankylosaurus end quote 
I guess that's a good point because we're talking mostly about the weight estimate, mm -hmm. which is what I usually promote in terms of what's bigger because this thing seems to have such a bulky chest that unless it was all just air in there, then that's a lot of mass. Mm -hmm. So even though the length estimate is sort of the same as the general hadrosaurid, it seems like it was quite a bit heavier potentially. Being all ponderous and whatnot. <laughs> that was the first time I'd heard that word or read that word. Hmm. Uh, however, they also said that it's small skull, circular chest, powerful forelimbs and claws and other elements, quote, probably even more strikingly recalled the form of giant ground sloths, end quote. Oh, that's a good comparison. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a type of animal that very few people know about, because you think of sloths as the things that are all slow in the trees. Yeah. Not these massive, basically, bears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, not your typical iguanodontid. It's large, so large it walked on four legs. It had a relatively small skull, long neck, massive forelimbs and thumb spikes, a bulky body, a relatively short tail, and hind limbs. It sounds like this one is uncontroversially... Large. Four-legged, too, quadrupedal. Yeah, I because think so. Because if it has that much of a bulky torso, it's going to shift its center of mass forward really far. And then if it has big old forearms mm -hmm. or arms to match it, it's probably walking on them. Yes. Yeah, it had large, stout limbs. And the forelimbs were about 60% the size of the hind limbs. Hmm. They estimated that the length of the skull of the holotype was about 2.9 feet or roughly 83 centimeters long. And it had a beak. The back of the skull was about 30 centimeters wide and the front was 20 centimeters, so it did not have a duck-like bill. It, it narrowed there. Yeah, because that's a foot wide mm. at the back of the head and about eight inches at the front of the head. I don't remember seeing that sort of taper, but considering the head is three feet long, mm -hmm. that four inch difference over three feet doesn't probably doesn't stand out to the eye that much. Yeah. Lurdosaurus also had between 12 and 14 neck vertebrae, and its neck is estimated to be 5.3 feet or 1.6 meters long. And the tail was about 13 feet or 4 meters long. <laughs> I don't remember the last time we talked about the neck length of something that's not a sauropod, mm -hmm. but a 5-foot neck of yep. just like a typical hadrosaur. This is a large dinosaur. <laughs> it's just crazy to think about a 5-foot neck on a hadrosaur. <laughs> well, it also had a short, powerful pelvis somewhat similar to ceratopsians. So we got ankylosaurs, ceratopsians, and giant ground sloths <laughs> in the mix here for comparing. <laughs> oh, and the femur had features like ceratopsians and sauropods. Makes sense if it's so heavy that sauropods would get thrown in the mix too. Yeah. The wrist bones were fused into a block and it had a large thumb spike. Taquette and Russell described the wrist and thumb claw as, quote, reminiscent of a mace and chain, end quote. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it probably used its thumb spike for defense. They also found that the bones in the foot were reduced, so the metatarsals, the bones leading up to the toes, quote, lost contact with each other and that a fleshy pad must have supported most of the weight borne by the foot, end quote. Which, we talk about that with sauropods, too. Yep, yeah, we had have, I think, seen some tracks and some indications that that was probably the case. And we know it's the case with pretty much every heavy mammal now. Like, mm -hmm. for example, elephants, most obviously, their foot is buried in a big old sea of fleshy, fatty pads. Yeah. <laughs> in 2007, Tom Holt suggested that Lurdosaurus acted like a hippo and was semi-aquatic. But I think he only suggested this. There's no studies around this. Why, Tom? <laughs> why? <laughs> I wonder why he would say that. Well, like a hippo, Lurdosaurus was stocky and usually moved slow, but could move fast when needed. Okay. If that's the only, although you said he said it was semi-aquatic. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's hard to say. It's but very hard to say. This suggestion could be why there's paleo art of lurdosaurus swimming there's a lot if you google it and it's only got its head above water very hippo like that way that's really interesting because we think sauropods their chests were like largely air filled and if it had a huge chest it'd be like trying to force a barrel underwater that's mostly full of air mm -hmm. like it's it would have a lot more than just its head above the water if it was swimming for sure <laughs> <laughs> Now, the type species of Lurdosaurus is Lurdosaurus arenatus. The fossils were found in 1965 by Philippe Taquet. The holotype is a nearly complete adult specimen with a fragmentary skull. It's only missing part of the skull, the sacrum, and a lot of the foot. So, yes, very nearly complete. 
They found tooth punctures around the pubic bones that were partly rehealed. Taquette said that it was large, and in 1976, in a brief description, said that this dinosaur should probably be its own genus. And then in 1988, Chobley described the specimen for her thesis and named it, in quotes, Gravisaurus tenorensis, but her thesis wasn't published, that's why the name's in quotes. And then it was formally named as Lurdosaurus in 1999 by Taquette and Dale Russell. They also referred a fragment of a dentary, the lower jaw, and right coracoid, part of the shoulder, to Lurdosaurus. The genus name, Lurdosaurus, means heavy lizard, and the species name, Arenatus, means sandy and refers to the fossils being found in a desert. Lurdosaurus lived in a tropical forest, though, but, you know, habitats change over millions and millions <laughs> of years. Now it's a desert. Yep. Uh, other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include iguanodonts, like Oranosaurus, Titanosaurs, the Spinosaurid Suchomimus, the Carcharodontosaurid Eocarcaria, the Abelosaurid Cryptops, and Noasaurids. And other animals that lived around the same time and place include crocodilomorphs and pterosaurs. That's a really cool dinosaur. Mm -hmm. A super bulky iguanodontian. I wonder, I don't think I've ever heard of Lerdu. Well, I, I did know that it was pronounced Lerdusaurus, but I didn't really know anything about it other than that there is a dinosaur named Lerdusaurus. Now you know it's <laughs> massive and had big thumb claws. Yeah. And our fun fact of the day is that Stegosaurus did not have a second brain at the base of its tail, aka in its butt. Yeah. <laughs> you already I, knew this? I think we knew that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to know. Maybe the fun fact should be that it was a legitimate hypothesis. It's not just something that a crazy person made up mm. and sort of, it doesn't have the same sort of origins as T-Rex can't see motion okay. or just sort of like a random thing in a movie or something like that. <laughs> so this was, I believe, first proposed by O.C. Marsh back in the Bone Wars days. That tracks. And he had a plausible reason beyond just the tiny walnut or lime, as it's often called, mm -hmm. sized brain that Stegosaurus has in its skull. Some sauropods, including Camarasaurus and many Stegosaurs, have a bit of an unusual neural canal. And the neural canal if you're not familiar, is the hole in the vertebra or in all the vertebrae that combine for the space that the spinal cord goes through. Hmm. So that's the neural canal. We talk about it a lot, it's sort of right in the middle of a vertebra. Those holes get larger in the vertebrae at the hips, aka the sacrum, in these certain stegosaurs and sauropods. So Marsh's hypothesis was that that space opened up for a second brain because at the front of the spinal cord and the head, you've got a brain. Mm -hmm. And if there's another bulky space opening in a bony body in the sacrum, mm -hmm. maybe there's a brain there too. It's a fairly reasonable thing to think, especially for something with a small brain. Although I guess maybe it's not super reasonable since we don't know of animals that have that, at least vertebrates. But dinosaurs were so new and different. Yeah. And there were all these thoughts like, oh, maybe it took too long for the information to get from the legs to the brain. And because of that, then, you know, it needs its extra brain by its tail. There was a good write-up in SV Pow too, where they were basically saying, there's sort of a misnomer that your brain does control every little motion of your body because when you're walking, even as a human, which the distance is much shorter from our legs to our brain, our spinal cord does a lot of the information management. Mm -hmm. So if you're just walking along casually, apparently your spinal cord is the one that's sort of communicating and orchestrating those movements of your legs. It doesn't have to go all the way up to the brain. Oh, okay. Yeah. So not necessarily a requirement, but it turns out that there is a much simpler explanation for what that space in the sacrum might be filled with because birds have the exact same thing. Of course, at the time, they didn't know that birds were dinosaurs. Well, Huxley knew. But we especially didn't know for large quadrupeds, yeah. like <laughs> sauropods and stegosaurs. Although you're right. I think there were some people that were hypothesizing this at the time. So birds fill that space with something that's called a glycogen body. And it's called a body because it's not an organ of its own or anything. It's just sort of an extra space. Unfortunately, we don't know what the glycogen body does to this day. I found a bunch of things talking about this in like 2010, 2012, and I tried looking again for like, what does the glycogen body do? 
and nobody seems to talk about it. Mm. <laughs> I just think people aren't all that interested in it. But it's called the glycogen body because it's an area full of a lot of cells that are high in glycogen. Again, it's not a separate organ. It's basically just a bulge in the spinal cord around the hips. As an analogy, I'd say glucose is to glycogen as oxygen is to a red blood cell. So the body needs glucose for energy and glycogen sort of stores it and transports it. And red blood cells do the same thing with oxygen, you know, just binding it up. Presumably, birds have a big bulge of extra glycogen in their spinal cords to store energy hmm. because, you know, that's what glycogen does. We store glycogen in our liver and our muscles. Theoretically, you could store glycogen anywhere in your body. Birds just have a special spot for it in their spinal cord, which is probably why people don't really bother studying it. It's just like, okay, there's a spot with extra glycogen. whoop de doo <laughs> <laughs> Like they need glycogen in their body. They store it in their spinal cord. It doesn't really matter. We know what glycogen does. We don't know why it's in that spot. We don't know why it's in our liver. You know, it's just like, mm -hmm. it's a spot where it's stored. It doesn't matter. It's a thing that happens. Yep. But seeing as dinosaurs were the ancestors to birds, birds probably inherited the glycogen body from dinosaurs. And dinosaurs probably just had the same store of glycogen in a bulge in their spinal cord and their hips. Just going about their days <laughs> with their one brain and their glycogen. Yep. <laughs> well, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week. We'll have another dinosaur connection challenge. And thanks again. And until next time. Get down, get down.